Hey everyone, welcome to the Wild and Uncut podcast brought to you by Ruger. I'm your host, Christy Titus. Thank you for tuning in. The line is going hot, so let's go full send on this episode. In a world where rugged and reliable matters, Ruger stands strong. Celebrating 75 years of American-made craftsmanship, Ruger continues to set the standard for excellence in firearms. From the iconic 1022 to the American rifle and beyond, each firearm embodies precision engineering and our deep-rooted traditions. Join us in honoring a legacy built on strength, innovation, and the American spirit. Hey, you guys, thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Wild and Uncut podcast. I'm your host, Christy Titus, and I'm here with SCI's 2023 Young Hunter Award winner, Libby Gear, and we are celebrating today. We're in San Antonio, yeah. and we are celebrating SCI's grand opening and official office merger with Texas Trophy Hunter Association. Yeah. So, awesome. this is your home state. Yeah. You grew up in Texas. I You're did. a Texas girl. Texas Where's your accent? Raised. I was wondering about that. So, born and raised in Fort Worth. So right in the stockyards. And you do not yeah. have an accent. Nope. I was expecting a y'all out of her and I haven't gotten one yet. I don't know what's going nope. on. No, unfortunately, I grew up in the heart of the city. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a country girl at heart, Yeah, but not much of an accent being from the city, unfortunately. Yeah, but. no, you're, there's no twang yeah. in your Texas. Yeah. But you are a Texas girl. I am. So you grew up on on a you guys have like a ranch out here then and you because your your heart is in white tail deer hunting yeah yeah so i grew up on a deer lease in south texas kind of down by Ensenal. um grew up hunting down there me and my dad would always take trips we would take trips as a family mm-hmm. um so i started out doing javelina hog white tail have a huge passion for white tail deer hunting kind of got hooked on that um from the start So yeah, that's kind of where the passion began down in South Texas. So in Texas, you don't have like a minimum age to go hunting. You're like four years old out there with a rifle. Yep. I'm joking. I mean, I have no idea how old. No, I started hunting at four. (laughs) I knew it. I knew it. (laughs) Yeah. So I started hunting at four um, down in South Texas. I want to say around four was the time I took my first javelina, um, which was the first animal we had to kill. Um, that was kind of like our family rule. Was, yeah. We started with Havelina and then slowly worked our way up. Yeah. But started that at the age of four and then um, actually took my first African safari at six. Wow. So what, what, what was the first country you went to? So the first country I went to was South Africa. Um, and I did an Eastern Cape Kudu and a Warthog. And that nice. was what started my international hunting career. Yeah. So you've been hunting internationally longer than me. <laughs> that is so awesome. Um, I won't say how old I am by comparison to you, Miss Libby, um, but I'm trying to think my first trip to Africa was only uh, 14 years ago. Okay. okay. So I've only been going, you know, international for yeah. the past 14 years. It was kind of, for me, not something I grew up with. So I really, um, as a child growing up and seeing other countries, now I know you have done some blue bag brigade yeah. work where you have, you know, served um, underprivileged communities in need with blue bags. Did you do that as a child too and get to see the optic of how other children lived at a young age? Yeah, yeah. So from the very first safari, I was exposed to a lot. And that I think was such a blessing um, because it just opened my eyes to meeting new people, seeing the world yeah. um, in a different lens. And so from a very young age, I was super passionate about helping others, getting very involved in conservation. Um, you know, we're hunters, but I, hunters are also conservationists. Absolutely. Um, and so that was something I always had a passion for as a kid um, and still do and still love it. Um, so I did my SCI blue bag going into my senior year of high school, Mm -hmm. um, and it was actually back on the Eastern Cape. Mm -hmm. So I was 18 Mm -hmm. back at where it had all started. We were actually on safari at the very first safari camp I ever went to at six. Um, and so I was able to go back at 18 and get those blue bags. And it was just a really cool kind of full 
full circle moment of being able to go back and finally kind of have the maturity to understand the weight of what we were doing and the way we were giving back and how impactful it was for the kids. So it was really neat. Mm -hmm. It's, if you know, the, when we talk about being impoverished or um, not having, the children there don't realize what they don't have. Right. They have no clue what, uh, how other cultures live. And, you know, when you walk into some of these schools and the children don't have shoes, they've never owned a pair of shoes, um, they've never seen chapstick, they, they don't have access to basic medication, they don't have a toothbrush or toothpaste, don't know what they are. Right. Um, it's really like, you know, you think about the fights that parents have with children to get them to brush their teeth and what a privilege that fight right. really is. And that's the really kind of, in my opinion, some of the powerful, um, the power of these blue bags is because we're able to take into these communities resources that are so overlooked here, right. that are needed there. Um, yeah. and, and that's the power of blue bags. And it's all, it's all donation, it's all volunteer. You know, you take, some people take an empty blue bag to Africa, mm -hmm. uh, whatever country they're visiting, and they'll fill them locally, which is the most yeah. economical way to do right. it, is, is just to take the bag empty, go to a local store, and, and actually talk to the people, like, what do these children need? So when you're visiting a school or you're visiting an orphanage, you know, talking with their teachers to find right. out where the needs are. Right. Um, sometimes that's with shoes, sometimes it's with stocking hats and basic medications or yeah. toothpaste and toothbrushes and um, stickers or crayons or school supplies that, you know, will enrich their learning yeah. environment as well. Definitely. It's so, Amy Bell's family uh, created that charity for on, on, on her her legacy and in her memory and it's something that is so impactful if you ever do get oh, yeah. to any country in Africa to bring a bag, SCI will, will send you the bag and have you enrich the lives of others. It's yeah. so, so pivotal. Yeah. No, it was incredible. It was a, an incredible experience and that's exactly what we did was we actually worked with our outfitter um, that we were going over there with and we were going to hunt with and they worked and contacted the local village and talked to actually the school teacher um, I want to say she taught, I want to say it was ages all the way from kindergarten to 12th grade. Mm -hmm. And they were all in one single classroom with one teacher. Um, we were actually able to talk to that teacher, get information back from her of what they needed, and we actually filled those bags mm -hmm. right there in South Africa mm -hmm. and gave them back. And I think if Africa has taught me anything, it's taught me the art of joy mm -hmm. because you meet the kids who are so happy. Yeah. You know, despite whatever circumstance they're in, they're just full of so much joy. And love. And love, and it's just, you go over there and you have an experience that I don't think you can really experience anywhere else in the world. Um, and Africa, I think, has definitely taught me the art of joy and the art of love, despite whatever circumstance you're facing, because that's exactly how those kids are. Mm -hmm. And so it's been an impactful experience, and I wouldn't trade that for the world. They're awesome. selfless. The children are yeah. selfless. Like, when I was there, it was lunchtime, and these children that barely have food to eat, they have an egg, and they'll hand you their egg, yep. and want to share their lunch with you, and you know that might be the only meal they right. have that day, and they're willing to share. And um, the heart, and like you say, the joy that they have, and um, it's really an incredible experience. I think, you know, we, you look at churches, and mission work, and philanthropic work, I, I think there's nothing better that can enrich your life than, than to giving to others. And, and this is just yeah, part of the SEI gift that, that the Amy Bell leg legacy has, has chartered and, and created yeah. a path forward to where we can all have a better life because of the experiences we have interacting with these children right. and helping their lives to be better, even if it's just for a day. Yeah, well, and I think SEI does such a phenomenal job of you know, promoting that as hunters and as conservationists, we have such a responsibility to give back and to make the world, to make the outdoors, to make the people mm -hmm. that we meet through hunting, to make it all a better place. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that their encouragement through the Blue Bag Foundation is just phenomenal. And what SCI and families and hunters have been able to do through the Blue Bag Foundation has just been awesome. And not just through the Blue Bags. Um, hunters are fueling the dietary needs of these yeah. families. So when you think about how children are getting meat, when I was over there, you know, we 
we harvested animals and there's nothing that's wasted. Right. And so there's a there's a huge negative connotation to the word trophy hunting. Well you're trophy hunting. Well to me that is, you know, harvesting a mature animal that has right. done his breeding and right. it's it's at that point in this life where yes, it is a trophy, but also it has it's a resource. And it's uh, a resource that's that's not underutilized in any right. country in Africa. And a lot of what we would do is we would harvest and then actually take meat to these kids um, and provide the meat. And during COVID especially, there was such a shortage because people weren't traveling right. to hunt. So there wasn't hunters kind of fueling that economy and providing that food resource and, and meat became an extreme, even more extreme scarcity. So it's really vital that you know, conservation is not only done through hunting and sound wildlife management principles, but we're actually feeding communities, right. schools. I mean, a lot of these kids are growing up in areas where HIV and AIDS has taken the lives of their parents. Yeah. Um, and so there is a lot of orphans because of diseases that, you know, communicable, communicable diseases and, and the misunderstanding of those diseases. Um, and so providing for these kids is something that is, we all, you know, if we're going to go to their country and we're going to take from the land, we should also be giving Give back, back to the communities. Yeah. And I think that's the greatest gift and joy that we have as being a hunter and yeah. a, a conservationist as well. But you're doing that now. You work with John Banovich. Yeah. And you have done, you've gone beyond, okay, just, hey, I'm going to provide meat. I'm going to go visit these schools and do blue bags. You're actually, you know, what spearheaded the work that you've done with John Banovich in your wheelchair program? Yeah. So I... And for those of you that are watching or listening and don't know who John Banovich is, he is one of the most famous artists um, and conservationists in yeah. SEI history. Oh, and he's just, he's an incredible human being. He's an incredible friend to our family. And he's just, he's so awesome to be around. And he is, you know, a true role model for mm -hmm. what it means to be a conservationist. And he has been so awesome to learn from. Um, but actually what speared my work with him was when I was 15. Um, I was blessed enough to receive the gift of a sweet 16. So I kind of spent a few months, you know, trying to play in the Sweet 16, and I knew I wanted to give back in a way. And so we reached out to John Banovich and his foundation, and we said, is there anything we can do to help y'all? Um, John Banovich is a very dear friend of my dad, um, and they've done some work together, and he's just been awesome. So we reached out to him, and we said, hey, is there anything we can do to help y'all? Got involved with the Kim Kim Lion Project. Mm -hmm. um, and so for my Sweet 16, instead of having people bring birthday gifts, um, I had my class donate money to the Kim Kim Lion Project and raising money to do tracking collars for lions. Mm -hmm. So that was the first project I did with him. And then a couple years so later... Elaborate on yeah. that. So you were doing tra tracking collars for lions. So you're working with SCI Foundation and their large carnivore yeah. wildlife biologist manager. I'm assuming you were working with Maria Davidson. I believe so, okay. maybe. So, and talk about a little bit of what you're doing with those collars. Yeah, so with those collars, they were in Tanzania. Um, and basically the purpose of them was to have these collars so that we could track the movement of lions, see where they went, kind of understand their pattern. Um, the human population was rising drastically. Um, and so we wanted to have a good understanding of these lions and their behavior to help provide the locals with a better understanding of how to interact with them. Mm -hmm. Obviously, as human population grows and you have a, you know, a lion population, understanding how they can coexist in mm -hmm. the same spaces was very important. Mm -hmm. And so these lion callers helped us be able to track the movement of these lions, understand where they were going, what they were doing, mm -hmm. when they did interact with people, what those interactions were like to help provide resources to the locals there. So the fundraiser you're doing is helping fund biological studies mm -hmm. that are going to impact a, an ecosystem and community for generations to yeah. come. That's pretty powerful yeah. at 15? Yeah. 15 years old? Yeah. Like, well, and the neat part about it was is I was getting my school class involved, and so these were kids that had no idea what international hunting was or what international conservation was. And I, you know, I was able to have con conversations with them and I was able to sit down and kind of explain what they were donating to and the impact that they were having. Mm -hmm. So it provided a, a, an amazing corridor to you know, introduce hunting, introduce conservation to kids who otherwise might not have had you know, much exposure to mm -hmm. it, which was really cool. Or had a negative spin on yeah. quote unquote African hunting or trophy hunting yeah. and, and a misunderstanding of that. Definitely. And perhaps they weren't 
anti-hunters at that point. Maybe they were just non-hunters, yeah. and and then your influence is able to kind of shape their opinions Definitely. of those young minds. Yeah. Which gave is them so a important. very positive outlook mm -hmm. on what we as hunters do. So you were a leader um, in your community and your age group from the time you were just so incredibly young. Yeah. Like 15 years old, yeah. that's incredible. Definitely tried to be. Um, I'm a big believer in, I think the generation before us has done a great job of protecting hunting and protecting mm -hmm. conservation. I think it's my generation's job to continue that work. Mm -hmm. And so I knew from a very young age, hunting and the, um, the sport of conservation was something that I wanted to fight to protect and I wanted to make sure that I did my job in getting the word out there and mm -hmm. you know telling people what hunting really was and what conservation was. Mm -hmm. And then so let's talk about so you're not only impacting wildlife studies you're also impacting communities. Yeah. So your wheelchair program that yeah. you also you once again reached out to John Janovich yeah. and said okay how can I help serve. Yeah so a couple years later I was like hey I'm you know I want to get back in what's something else I can do I was still in high school at the time and he said, this is what we're doing. We're raising money to send wheelchairs over to Africa for kids and people in need. And I said, awesome. Mm -hmm. That sounds like something I want to be a part of. Um, and so I sent letters out to family members and classmates and people that I knew. And I was like, hey, this is what we're doing. If it's something you, know, you feel called or interested in, we would love to have your help. And so just got as many people as I could involved and raised as much money as I could. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we were able to send some wheelchairs over to Africa. That really it was like 250, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not some. <laughs> like this, this is impact. Yeah. You impacted 250 people yeah. profoundly yeah. to give them access to resources that otherwise, without you, they right. wouldn't have. Right. Right. Which, unfortunately, I wasn't able to go over there and actually have boots on the ground when they handed the wheelchairs out. But I was able to get pictures back, and mm -hmm. I was able to really see the impact that it had, and that was so special because. You know, these kids and these people otherwise wouldn't have this opportunity. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of these kids, it changes the trajectory of their life. Mm -hmm. It enables them to do more than they ever would. And that that's just so impactful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is, um, what made you, at what point in your young life did you become this instant leader? Because what I see a lot of people reach out to me and they'll say, well, um, you know, how do you start this or how do I get involved with that? And, and I think, you know, being a leader is taking that initiative, finding a need and finding a way to, or seeing a need and finding a way to fill that need. Right. And you have to have not only vision, but perspective on how to execute a plan. Yeah. And at 15 years old, how do you think, or what was that calling for you that was like, hey, I need to, I see this need in these communities. Do you think that attributes back to your hunting life as a Most young definitely. age? Or, or where did it become like, hey, I'm a leader, I can help and I can give. What, what point did you yeah. see that? I think growing up, spending so much time in Africa at such a young age, one of the things that that provided with me was just such a love for people. Um, and then I will also credit my parents. They mm -hmm. were phenomenal. And they raised both me and my sister to, you know, stand up tall, be strong, be independent. Mm -hmm. But most importantly, I think the thing that they taught us more than anything was that our job is to love people mm -hmm. um, and to leave an impact in the places that we go and never to be a follower, but to be a leader, to be very passionate about the things that we dedicate our time to. And, um, you know, I was so lucky that my dad was so passionate about hunting because it enabled me to be passionate about hunting mm -hmm. at such a young age. Yeah. And so, you know, as a little kid or as a middle schooler, or even as a high schooler, yeah. when I would go to my parents and I'd be like, I feel like there's things we can do and I don't want to wait. You know, I want to do them now. I know I'm young, um, you know, and I may not necessarily know or knew at the time how to make it happen, but I knew that I always wanted to because they instilled, you know, that quality of give back and mm -hmm. love people and do what you can mm -hmm. to impact others. And so I would go to them and I would be like, hey, I, I want to do something. I want to leave an impact. I, I want to impact other people's lives. How do I do it? Mm -hmm. And they were so awesome and supported me all the way through it. And, you know, my dad was like, this is who we can get in contact with. Mm -hmm. Or these are people that we can reach out to to see if they have projects. Um, John Banovich, once again, was just so awesome yeah. and being like, you know what? You're young, but I love that. Mm -hmm. um, you want to make an impact? Let's do that. Mm -hmm. And so having a community around me 
that didn't really look at my age as a factor, mm -hmm. just knew that I wanted to make an impact and I was working with other people who wanted to make an impact. And then with the support of my family, you know, you put all of that together. Mm -hmm. And I was just, I've always been able to make those things possible, which has just been the biggest blessing. Yeah. People can serve what they love yep. and they love what they know. And that is why it is so important to introduce people to um, the power of conservation through hunting. Because if you don't love hunting, you don't understand necessarily the conservation that right. comes through hunting. So it's both, it's twofold. Um, introducing your class to what you're doing with your lion project, your coloring project, people might say like, hey, you guys hunt lions. But there's also a point of, okay, well we conserve what we love. Right and we're actually impacting these species that we hunt and we want to make sure that they have a brighter future than when, when right. we arrived on the scene. Right. And that was something you know, that I had to learn. Um, you know, I took my second African safari at the age of eight and then you know, there was kind of a span of time between the age of like eight, 10, 12, where I was kind of like, you know, I love hunting, but what's the science behind it? Mm -hmm. What is it? What impact am I leaving? Yeah. And so being able to really sit down and I remember having conversations at the dinner table with my dad, being like, hey, I love hunting, but I want to understand, you know, the science behind it. What are we doing? What impact are we leaving? And so being able to have those conversations with him and him, him and even my mom really sit down and explain the science behind it, explain the impact behind mm -hmm. it. It's like, okay, I'm not just going over and harvesting a trophy. I'm going over there and I'm impacting entire communities, yeah. entire, you know, in a sense, entire countries. Mm -hmm. um, even here in the States, one of the things that I got involved in my freshman year of college was Hunters for the Hungry. Mm -hmm. And so giving back to communities here in the States, to families in need here in the States, understanding that there's an entire mm -hmm. science behind it. And, you know, like you said, you can serve what you love. And I've always loved the outdoors, mm -hmm. and I wanna make sure that that's something my kids have, my grandkids have, generations to come, are able to grow up in the outdoors and have the same similar experiences that I've had. But in order to do that, we have to protect it, we have to conserve it, yeah. um, and we have to make sure that you know we're working to spread the word on what it is that we truly do. Yeah, sustainable harvest and, and sharing in that harvest. And there's so many people in need um, and I know you know for myself personally um, I, because of what I do I have the opportunity to harvest a lot of animals yeah. and I nothing is wasted that nope. we harvest um, yeah. everything is donated to families in need and there are so many people um, that have a need for a resource and as we all know inflation and the price of everything is getting so costly um, that it is nice to give back yeah. so you know when I hunt whitetail in Missouri or um, Texas or wherever, it's nice to be able to take that meat and have a, a location to donate. And Hunters for the Hungry is an NRA kind of spearheaded program. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of subsidiary uh, programs that are similar that, you know, yeah. if you guys are looking for a program like that, if you contact a lot of your local butcher shops, mm -hmm. they'll tell you in Wyoming they have their own, um, J Jenny Gordon started her own um, um, program, the name of it escapes me, Lord, I apologize. Um, but if you look into each one of your states, if you're looking for a place to donate or give back or contribute, um, there's typically a place to do that right. locally. And I think for me, it's also a really great value to teach kids. Yep. So, okay, if we're gonna harvest, we're gonna serve our family, we're gonna provide for our family, but how can we also serve and provide for other people right. and teaching that and instilling that, that it's not just about taking, it's also always about giving yeah. back. Yeah. Yeah. And that is something that I think is one of the most important things as a hunter and as a conservationist, you know, to know and to teach not, you know, nothing goes to waste. If my family is not eating it, somebody else is. Yeah. And you know, you see that firsthand in Africa, you know, if we harvested an animal, two, three days later, we were eating it. Mm -hmm. And if we weren't eating it, the locals were eating it. Mm -hmm. um, and then being able to come you know, back here in my home state of Texas and give back to Hunters of the mm -hmm. Hungry. Um, I actually worked with, I'm super involved in the SEI Kentuckiana chapter. I have a great community there. Kentuckiana. Yeah. That's a great name. The yeah. Kentuckiana chapter. Yeah. I like that. Okay. Yeah, they're awesome. Um, I found a great community through them and they do a lot with their youth, which is mm -hmm. awesome. But 
when Kentucky was hit with a massive flood, mm -hmm. um, you know, my early years in college, they reached out and they were like, hey, we've got a butcher shop that played a huge role in Hunters for the Hungry and they've lost everything in this flood. Mm -hmm. Would you be interested in helping this butcher shop get back on their feet so that Hunters for the Hungry can continue, can continue their work? And I was like, of course. And so I did what I could, you know, from the great state of Texas mm -hmm. in helping that butcher shop in that community, which just goes to show that it doesn't matter where you are, mm -hmm. us hunters all work together. Mm -hmm. and we all have the same mission, the same goals, which I think is something that is so awesome about the hunting community, um, is that we all share the same purpose of making sure we give back to the land, to the people, and really making the most of all of our experiences. Is that why you want to be a lawyer? <laughs> You're like, I'm going to give back, I'm going to help people. Yeah. What kind of law are you getting into? Because that's kind so, of your next step, isn't yeah. it? You're like, I'm all excited to go to law school. Yeah. So it's my next step. It's definitely a little intimidating, mm -hmm. a little nerve-wracking. Um, I'm a first-generation law student, so I have no idea what I'm getting myself into. Um, but so you actually, can't call your dad and be like, hey, dad, how was the yeah, bar exam? Yeah. Because you're it. Right. Yeah. Well, and it was funny when I was on my law school tour, um, they referenced me as a first generation. And my mom was like, she's not a first generation. And I was like, I am. I'm a first generation law student. Yeah. And she was like, oh, I was thinking college. Mm -hmm. You know, this is post She's like, I didn't even think about it. Um, so it's kind of been a shock to the whole family. We know we're all kind of like, none of us know what to expect. But super excited. Um, and I think what really spearheaded my desire to go to law school was to have the opportunity to make an impact. Mm -hmm. um, I will be, my plan right now is to specialize in law and science is actually the specialty at Texas Tech where I will be going. Um, but my plan is to get back involved with conservation. Mm -hmm. um, I've actually met a couple of SCI's litigators and their Maddie team. Damaski. Oh, she is one of my She's dearest amazing. friends. She's <laughs> awesome. And when yeah. I tell people who I want to be when I grow up, I'm like, Maddie. I want to be Maddie. I want to be Maddie. Yeah. Um, but yeah, kind of go that route and, mm -hmm. you know, trust that there's a next generation coming up that yeah. will be able to go to D.C. and fight for our rights and we'll be able to go to our state capitals and fight for our rights and make sure that the sport and conservation are protected because, you know, I think hunters, ranchers and farmers, mm -hmm. we've got a lot to fight for coming right. up and um, we've got a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. And so I want to make sure that, you know, there's a generation of leaders that are academically prepared to take that battle on mm -hmm. and I you know for me personally I felt like law school was kind of the best route to make sure that I was ready for that fight. Well and that's what I love about SEI as an organization. Um, they have like we're in San Antonio with a new corporate headquarters but they also have a headquarters in Washington yeah. DC where um, Ben Cassidy is there on the ground amongst a, a team of lawyers uh, and they're, they're have their po their finger on the pulse right. of what is going on, what decision makers are doing, how lobbyists are spinning, <laughs> yep. spinning <laughs> narratives in Washington D.C. either for us or against us. And you know they're 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 the first people with feet on the ground right. in the courtroom and present. In the heart of the wilderness, every step counts. No matter where or what you're hunting, Onyx Hunt Elite has you covered in the U.S. and Canada with offline capability, land ownership, 3D mapping, and you can even access specialty courses, hunt research tools, and elite-specific features. No matter where you pursue the wild, adventure is assured when you upgrade to Elite for the ultimate hunting experience. There are a lot of Americans that understand the value of hunting, but we all know that right now, national support of hunting is extremely volatile. It seems that with every passing day, our voice is diminished and the court of public opinion is not effectively hearing our side. We need advocates working on our behalf in Washington, D.C. to defend our freedom to hunt. And thankfully, when we need it the most, we have that advocate in Safari Club International. SCI's world headquarters are located in Washington, D.C., just blocks from the United States Capitol, which means that SCI is on the ground with our congressional leaders and federal agencies on our behalf, on behalf of the hunting community. SCI has an active political presence in all 50 states, 
through their extensive chapter network and government affairs staff. If you have ever wondered why you should be a member of SCI, you shouldn't wonder anymore. Join us in the fight to defend hunting. Go to safariclub.org to learn more. In my opinion, our hunting rights are lost in a couple of different ways. Number one is the court of public opinion, which is why it's so important what the work you're doing um, or have done thus far in your young life with influencing people in your community. And really being a leader starts with leading in our own communities. It starts with our own kitchen table and it, oh. and it spreads out from there. And then the second way is in the court, uh, our legal system. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that you're gonna take your passion for conservation and you're gonna ratchet it up and how can I serve to ensure and work with an organization like SCI to ensure that we have the legal right yeah. uh, to hunt, which is one of the reasons I moved to Wyoming, is that we have a right to hunt and fish right. state. And in passing that, is, that type of legislation is so important. Um, we need young minds like yourself that are, are willing to step in as, especially as the hunting community right. ages. We need young people coming in and saying, hey, I understand conservation through hunting. I understand the value of it and the importance of it. And I'm here to, get educated so I can protect it professionally. Right. right. Well, and I, you know, I will take no credit and I did not grow up on a ranch or anything like that, but how important it is for us to not only protect hunting, but to protect the land, to protect our farmers, to protect our ranchers. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a whole lifestyle that we're, you know, fighting to protect. And unfortunately, I think, you know, my generation grew up so much around big cities, technology, mm -hmm. um, and just this atmosphere of just being so industrialized, mm -hmm. um, so focused on technology that, you know, I think a lot of my generation forgets we have land to protect, we have agriculture to protect, we have the outdoors to protect. Mm -hmm. And so knowing that that leadership is gonna be needed in our generation has just been something I'm super passionate about. My parents always told me that if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your That's life. That's a fact. And so to always do what you love. Mm -hmm. And so, it's something I love. It's something I'm passionate about. Um, as intimidating as the thought of law school can be, oh girl, I'm, you're gonna rock it. You're I'm gonna super be so excited. Fine, yeah, Thank because you. you have a you have a vision, right? And, right. And I was. I, it's so important that you know. Again, as a leader, you see a need and you find a way. How can I help fill right. this need? And you have a calling, and you're obviously a natural born leader. You are gonna be amazing because Thank you're you. gonna fight with passion. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that that's something that you know, is so important. And that's something, again, that I've loved about the SCI community. It's just meeting so many people who are passionate. Mm -hmm. I think hunters are probably the most passionate group of people I have ever been around. Um, I've grown up an athlete my entire life, played, you know, sports at the collegiate level. That passion has not even come close to the passion that I see within mm -hmm. the hunting community. And the people that are in this industry. And I think that that's what's been so fun to be around. And I think even, you know, when you look at college sports and being an athlete, um, all of that is great. And you're working as a team and, and you're building some great characteristics as, you know, as a young adult going into adulthood, but it still doesn't have the impact on a community right. and communities and ecosystems and, <laughs> um, everything from the economy, local economies like th that right. hunting has. And it's really hard to have that breadth of understanding um, for people that don't come from a hunting right. background. So everything that you're doing is so impactful and um, you're so disciplined. Uh, it's just yeah. unbelievable to me how someone can be such a young mind, 15 years old, it just blows my mind. The need that you saw in communities and you were willing to step up and, and wanting to take those yeah. steps. Thank you. Yeah, it's been a huge blessing. And like I said, just the support that I've had through my family, um, through my outfitters in Africa, the, mm -hmm. out, the people that we use as outfitters in South Africa have become so close to us. Like They're family. like family. Mm -hmm. um, I was actually in their oldest son when he got married. I was in his wedding ah. as a bridesmaid because I got so close to his wife. Ah. And they're just, they have become so close mm -hmm. and such like family. Um, you know, they've supported me through everything as well. And I think it just, you know, goes to show what is so special mm -hmm. about, you know, what we do. And that makes me so excited for the future. Yeah. So how many years will you be in law school? So it's three years. So it's not too long. No. Um, you know, we'll hit the ground running at the yeah. beginning of August. Um, and then it'll be about three years. Yeah. 
So in three years, what is your goal? What do you? What is your dream? Oh, Where do you want to be? I would love to come back and you know, if SCI has a position that mm -hmm. they you know need filled, I would love to have that opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, but really, wherever there's a need, my yeah. passion, you know, would be to step in and kind of fill that need. Yeah. Definitely work within the industry, mm -hmm. um, whether that be from a, you know, a volunteer position. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I think is so great about a law degree is it's so versatile. Yeah. Um, and so even if it's just, you know, partnering with SCI as a volunteer to start out, you know, whatever it is, mm -hmm. um, making sure I stay involved in the industry and with the organization because they do a lot of awesome work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and with the new corporate headquarters in Texas, yeah, you can stay in They're right home here, state. yeah. How convenient yeah. is that? <laughs> That's actually perfect. Yeah, yeah, well, and I may be a little biased because I'm Texas born and raised, but I don't think there's a better place for SCI to be. To be. Mm -hmm. um, we say everything's better in Texas. And bigger. Bigger and better. Bigger and uh, better. <laughs> which, like I said, I'm probably a little biased, but I'm glad that they're here and I think they'll fit in just great. Are you working on any other hunts while you're spending the next yeah. three years basically professionally reading. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which is that's so what you're gonna funny be doing. because I don't, that's one thing I'm scared about. I'm not a big reader. Yeah. So we'll see how this goes. You're gonna be a voracious um, reader here yeah. pretty soon because that's all you're gonna do yeah. is read. <laughs> so I went on an Alaskan hunt this past August mm -hmm. and did a mountain goat hunt. However, I did not come away with a harvest only because the Alaskan fog Oh. decided to turn our five-day hunt into a 12-day stay. Yeah. And of those 12 days, we got about four hours worth of hunting in. Oh, no. So that was an adventure. Um, so definitely have that, you know, kind of on the horizon of trying to get back out to Alaska and get a mountain goat. That's a hunt I really want to do with my dad. Mm -hmm. And so he's kind of like, yeah, let me do it while I have the energy to do it. So we're trying to get that back on the book. Yeah, because um, they live in some rough stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that was my first time to Alaska and that's a whole new, whole new ball Did the mosquitoes carry you away? So they weren't bad. Yeah, now it may have been the fog, I don't know, oh. um, but they weren't too terrible. Good. Um, it was definitely wetter than I expected. Mm -hmm. I, I did not come with the proper like camp shoes. Yeah. You know, I had my hiking boots, but I was like, oh, I don't really need shoes to like hang around camp in because we'll be hunting the whole time. We were in camp the whole for time. The whole time, and all I had was like a pair of old Crocs. Yeah. So my feet stayed quite wet when we were hanging around camp, um, but it was beautiful. Yeah. When we could see and the fog had lifted, Alaska was absolutely stunning. Yeah. And that was an experience unlike anything else. Um, but the mosquitoes weren't too bad. We had bug nets. Yeah. So that kind of helped. Um, but, and then my dad actually just two weeks ago, a week ago, got back from British Columbia where he did a black bear hunt. And he called me while he was up there and he was like, I already told him you're coming. So we'll look at the calendar and we'll figure out when he can come, can come up here and do that. So that's on the books, hopefully here in the next two-ish years, mm -hmm. but trying to work hunting in with my school schedule it's has gonna always be a lot. been, it's yeah. It's going to be a lot. And do you have any other projects that you're planning philanthropic-wise right now? Yeah, so we'll see if anything comes about it. We're working on potentially having a youth event mm -hmm. in Nashville coming up mm -hmm. um, to make sure, you know, we keep the youth involved. Mm -hmm. Um, that is something I have a huge passion for, and not just youth, but young hunters in general. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a small population of us, but we're out there. Yeah. And I think meeting community, you know, I've been able to meet a lot of the other young hunters. Mm -hmm. And it's just so amazing, you know, I don't want to say it's a breath of fresh air, but just having that community yeah. of people that are your age, that are going through the same stage of mm -hmm. life, and you share the same passion. And really similar awesome. goals. Yeah. Yeah, so we're working on potentially doing an event in Nashville. I, I don't know yet yeah. because it just kind of started, but we'll see about that. Um, well, and we met yeah. at the Women Go Hunting yeah. event, which is awesome. Because, that is my favorite yeah. SCI event. I just think it's so yeah. amazing. Well, Denise Welker has been an incredible leader. She saw a need. Um, and that's what I, I just I can't stress it enough for every one of us to look inside ourselves and become the leader that that we that yeah. there's there's yeah. going to be a void in our lives where we need a good leader. How can we be that leader in our own communities and reach yeah. out? Because I would never have met you yeah. if it weren't for right. Denise and her leadership of 
having this vision for women go hunting right. to encourage women not only to hunt but just to be in wild places right. and enjoy wild spaces. Right. I had no idea the community that we had within yeah. you know women that hunt mm -hmm. and when I first stepped into that event I was like wow there's a there, lot of, there's women a lot there. of us yeah. and all we needed was the you know the opportunity to connect yeah. um, and I had the opportunity to meet yeah. her and she's awesome yeah. and just what she's been able to do through the organization has been incredible you know that was I want to say that's also where I met Maddie mm -hmm. and me and her have just mm -hmm. you know she's become a really really dear friend of mine um, Rachel Settle who's also worked with SCI mm -hmm. met her that year and you know she's become a great friend and mm -hmm. she's done um, a lot of really great things for me so that was awesome this is overall a really really great event yeah. so we're hoping to do something similar for young hunters and the youth yeah but we'll see yeah, well, and it's just creating that community and a place where you guys can idea share and talk about how, you know, I hate to keep calling you the younger generation, oh, yeah. <laughs> but I'm going to do that, <laughs> uh, but how this, you know, how you being a younger generation can spearhead leadership, yeah. take this conservation principles, at hunt, hunting through conservation, and impact yeah. your communities, because yeah. we need that. And then, and, you know, the hunting community, unfortunately, is aging. I mean, that's just yeah. a statistical fact. So yeah. it is so important that we have moms involved, which is why Denise's Women right. Go Hunting is so important. And then we have, because we get the mom, we get the kids. Yep. We get the yep. whole family. Oh, the fact that my mom supported us, I think made all of the difference. Yeah. And I mean, she is the most amazing woman and she has impacted my life in so many ways and if I can be half the woman half the mom that she is mm -hmm. I you know believe I will have succeeded um, but her support mm -hmm. you know I loved the time with my dad and yeah. the bonding with my dad is one of the things I love most about the sport but her support yeah um, she herself goes on the safaris she herself doesn't harvest any animals but she's our number one cheerleader mm -hmm. and having her support I think influenced me and my sister a yeah. lot more than maybe we would have realized at the time. Mm -hmm. But I totally agree. You get the mom, you get the kid. Um, and so that is, that's vitally important. My family is very similar to yours in that my mom is a non-hunter. Yep. Um, she watched an antelope get hit by a car the other day and it just wrecked her life for the better part of the week. And, and of course, as a hunter, you never want to see an animal, right? you know, taken in that capacity like it, it's just it's especially it's like this needless death right? right like it's it's very hard to see it's tragic um so my mom has never been able to like actually go out and take an animal herself she just has no interest in right. it however when my father and i bring home game she is the first one that has the knife sharpened yep. and the cutting board is out and she's ready to process it and package it and that is something as a kid you know, my mom was always supportive of that and ready to process the harvest. She prepared meals for us so that when we would go out, we would have good food to eat. Yeah. And then when we would come home tired, she always had something nice yep. for us to come home to. And so I think for women, it's finding your role and, and young people as well as finding your role and where you fit into yep. hunting because you don't have to necessarily be the person that does the harvesting right. to be a hunter conservationist. Right. And that's a that's a difficult story to tell. A lot of women say, "Well, I don't hunt, so I, I don't want to go." And it's like, no, you need to go right. and be a part, part of, of it. it. Yeah. Well, and I, you know, growing up hunting, it was always when we had the opportunity to go out, we were kind of me and my sister were the ones hunting. We were the ones pulling the trigger. We were the ones harvesting the animals. Um, that role has, you know, as I've gotten older, has kind of I've had the opportunity to kind of be on the other side and mm -hmm. be the person to watch. And actually, one of my all-time favorite hunting experiences and stories was down in South Texas where it all started a couple of years ago watching my dad actually harvest mm -hmm. his biggest whitetail to date and just being with him on that hunt experiencing that hunt with him you know I had no part in the harvest itself but that experience mm -hmm. what is you know I tell people that's one of my favorite hunts yeah. just because you know those are memories that you keep forever whether you're the one harvesting the animal or not yeah. Um, and that's something my mom has always understood. Mm -hmm. And, you know, hunting is not easy. It's not always successful. No. Um, you know, and I, I say successful in terms of harvesting. Harvest. Um, you know, they're always successful in terms of always making memories and leaving an impact and being impacted. Um, but in terms of a harvest, you know, you're not always successful. And there were a lot of times where I'd either been on a long stock and hadn't been successful or had missed a time or two. and. You know, at times we've all been there. 
<laughs> at times it can be hard to, you know, not get in your head. You know, mm -hmm. there have been a couple hunts, you know, where I've injured an animal and that's really hard. It's and so, the worst, actually, yeah. I think, especially, you know, the, as a hunter, the, the one thing we don't want to do is ever is ever wound. Right. You know, we, we want right. to give that animal the most reverence and respect possible and it's it's devastating and heartbreaking if and when it ever should occur for right. us, you know, right. it's hard. Yeah, I hunt because I love the animals. That's right. Um, and my mom in those situations was always the first person to, you know, remind me and be like, hey kid, you're not going to give up, mm -hmm. but pick your head back up, you know, you still got work to do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you owe it to yourself, you owe it to the animals. And so she's always kind of been the person to pick me up, brush me off, and yeah. make sure I keep going. And so her support has really impacted me. She was the one that came with me to the Women's Mix and Mingle. Yeah. Um, it was fun. Actually, the night I won my award, we were able to sit down and get hair and makeup done together, which was so fun. Yeah. Um, I will remember that for forever. And did you have a beautiful gown? I did. Yeah. I that did. Is, the gowns are, I love the yeah. Young Hunter gowns. Everybody looks so beautiful. It's yeah. like. Yeah. That was when we were able to go shopping a couple yeah. months before. It was just neat. Um, but yeah, she has just been the most amazing supporter through mm -hmm. it all. And then, you know, having my dad right there next to me be my best friend through all of it. Mm -hmm. It's a really neat dynamic. And he probably taught you to shoot and everything you know. Yeah. Yeah, he really did. Um, it's funny. I tell people now, now that I'm getting older, I actually feel like I need more practice shooting yeah. than I did when I was a kid. I was like, I overthink it more now mm -hmm. than I did when I was six. Yeah. Um, but yeah, some of the first animals I harvested, I was sitting on his lap, you know, and he was helping steady me and... Um, Talk you through the shot. Yeah. And yeah, and so even, even, even to this day, you know, if I get in a little rut and I'm, you know, my shooting's off or can't figure it out or whatever, he's kind of the first person in my ear being like, yeah. okay, this is what you do. And, all of that. So yeah, he's been my best friend through all of it. And for sure. even if he's not with you, then you probably subconsciously hear him anyway. <laughs> yep. Yep. Definitely. Um, it's yeah. I don't think I'll ever be able to go out on a hunt and not have my dad. Yeah. You know, if he's with me in person or when he's not, you know, I'll still have him in the back of my ear. Yeah. I'll still be able to hear him, and I'll, and I don't think that'll ever change. No, and that's the I think. I mean, even for me. Um, like people always ask me, well, what's your favorite animal to hunt or what's your favorite hunt? And, you know, my answer is always the same. It's like, oh, archery elk hunting with my dad. Yeah. And for me, it was interesting because I got my dad into bow hunting. Okay. Um, and so I was in my 20s when I started bow hunting and I got my dad into bow hunting and he rarely picks up a rifle. Um, but he did last year and he, he harvested a bull elk with me last year. And it's, it's as you get older, it's, you will eventually see kind of the shift where I'm at in my hunting life is... I went from my dad mentoring me to now, in ways, I mentor my dad, yeah. um, which is, I don't know, sounds so weird, but there is a, there is a shift a, yeah. in parody in there. Um, you know, my dad has never, uh, you know, shot, you know, long range, and I would consider long range. And last year, he took a bull elk at 500 yards and, you know, wow. walked him through the yeah. shot. Like, I walked That's him awesome. through the whole thing, and as a daughter, that that was a pretty cool moment for me yeah. because this is the man that has taught me everything right. that I know and my entire appreciation for wildlife and wild places right. and and conservation. Um, and now I'm helping him have a better experience as well. Yeah. Um, and you'll get there yeah. with your dad one day. Oh, he's and already joking. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, he's like, can you hurry up and graduate so you can take me on hunt? I know. <laughs> so, yeah. but yeah, we have a great time. And actually, it's funny, if parents ever need a way to motivate their kids, he did a really great job of it because he always told me, if you stay on top of your schoolwork and you get good grades, I'll get you out of school a day or two early and we'll go down to the deer lease and we'll go hunting. So that was always my motivation to get good grades. So if parents ever need any ideas, it worked pretty well for us. So. <laughs> You're like, good grades <laughs> equals deer hunting yep. and less school. Okay, I got this. <laughs> yeah, so I always kind of used that um, uh, you know, as motivation because I wanted that time yeah. to spend with him. And it's actually funny. I tell people I learned just as much out in the bush as I did in any classroom. Yeah. For sure. Well, and you probably learn more in a different way. Yep. Right? It's a different type of learning. And it, I think traveling, if you have the luxury of taking your kids traveling, even if it's just traveling locally. Right. Um, it's so important to have those experiences and to be in nature. And there's something that, that changes in you 
you know, oh, there's so many kids that don't know where their meat comes from. Right. They think it comes from, you get pork from the grocery store, and then when you actually take them to a farm where there's pigs, they're like, ah, yeah. you're, gonna, you're not gonna eat that. Well, yeah, that's bacon, no. Yeah. yeah. You know, and so just even having like these little, smaller, local experiences are so impactful. Yeah. Um, and, and life-shaping. Yeah. Well, it's funny. You know, growing up in Fort Worth, our deer lease, you know, it was a six and a half ish hour drive down to South Texas. And even within that six hours, you know, it's a different culture. Mm -hmm. The people are different, mm -hmm. you know, different. The country looks different. Mm -hmm. you know, they the have an accent drive. unlike you. Yeah, they do. <laughs> they have a true accent. If I'm down here for too long, it's really bad because I start picking it up. If I go to Canada, I start going, eh? I don't know what that is. <laughs> like the accent thing in me, I can't be around people with accents because I start sounding like right. I'm really bad. So I don't know how you pulled this off, but you, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny. So I went to school in, out in East Texas for undergrad and they have an accent out there mm -hmm. as well. Um, you're going to come home at Christmas and your dad's going to be like, like who oh, are you? Yep. <laughs> Where did this accent come from? Yeah. But even just, you know, that, those trips yeah. and just having that experience of being in a different place around different people, mm -hmm. it, it impacts you mm -hmm. and it teaches you something. Mm -hmm. um, I can't think of any hunt that I ever went on that I didn't learn something or I wasn't impacted in a way, mm -hmm. um, which is just another really cool thing about yeah. hunting. So any more advice to parents on, hey, how to captivate the attention of their kids? Because some kids are yeah. very device driven. Yeah. Um, one, I don't think kids are ever too young to start hunting. Yeah. Um, I'm a huge advocate for that. I started at four. Yeah. I was a little four year old little girl. If I can do it at four, anybody can do it at four. That's right. Um, so they're never too young. I also think that there is just something magical about being outside. Get your kids outside, let them play, let them get muddy, let them get dirty. My parents did it. We had a blast. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there were lots of times where we did have to get hosed off and you know, that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. It's okay to get dirty. It's okay to be outside. You know, let the kids have that experience yeah. because it's awesome. Um, you know, give your kids the opportunity to be around community of other kids mm -hmm. that are like that as well. Mm -hmm. um, the friendships that I acquired, you know, with our outfitting family um, and their kids, we all still talk. We're all still connected. You know, their their two sons are off married now with kids and they're like cousins. You know, yeah. Well, we get called. Me and my sister both get called aunts, and mm -hmm. you know that all started from a friendship when I was six. Mm -hmm. um, and so you know, surround your kids with that community. Know that they're never too young. Bring them with you. Yeah. Um, one of the things I loved about my dad was you know if he went to the deer lease, he made sure to bring us at least once a year. Mm -hmm. So bring your kids with you. Let them experience it. Um, because I truly think if given the opportunity, people fall in love with it. Yeah, so. I agree. How can you not fall in love with mother nature? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I remember the first time I dug potatoes out of the ground and they were warm. And I, I, you know, when you get them out of the grocery store, they're cold. And I'm like, wait, these potatoes are warm. And then it was the first time in my life I really like thought mother nature. Yeah. Like this earth is warming these potatoes and growing them like similar to a mother yep. with a baby in the womb. I mean, it's, the mother nature is a beautiful, beautiful experience. Yeah. And whether it's, you know, in your home state of Texas or wherever you live, you're back 40, or if you have the privilege of going international, yeah. um, just experiencing um, what goes into these, into these communities, into the wild places and into cultivating a future that's the yeah. right is so important and, yeah. and without feeling that it's really hard to yeah. love it and it's that's what's so important is you have to know it to love it yeah well and you know I think that you know you made a really good point it doesn't matter where you are um, you know I've met people when I tell them what I do they're like oh well that's awesome but I could never hunt in Africa I'm like you don't have to hunt in no. Africa you can hunt right you know, wherever it is that yeah. you are, you know, in Texas, we're big pig hunters. Yeah. You know, let your kids go out and pig hunt. Well, in the Indiana, they do these little squirrel hunts. Yeah. And they take the kids and they do squirrel hunts and then they fry the squirrel at the end and yeah. eat it. And it's like a thing. You know, You're like, got, who's going to get the most squirrels? Yeah. Like, whatever you are. Yeah, dove's a big thing out yeah. here. You know, let your kids go dove hunting. Yeah. Let them, you know, hunt javelina. You mm -hmm. know, whatever it is, you know, mm -hmm. there's an opportunity wherever you are to get involved in the community. And that's something that's so great about it is you don't have to go overseas. Are those experiences amazing? Mm -hmm. Of course. Are they a blessing? Of course. But you don't have to have those experiences mm -hmm. to be in the community. Yeah. Um, so get outside, get yeah. the experiences, 
you know, wherever you are, you can hunt. Yeah. And so I think that that's something that's really awesome. So if people want to follow you, can they follow your journeys on social yeah. media? Do you have like a public facing? Yeah, so I account? do have my Instagram and Facebook are all public. So, and I, if I am on a hunt, if I am out, my family was just blessed enough to be able to get some land out in um, Bayard right outside of Abilene, Texas. And so we're working on some stuff out there. And nice. so our journeys out there are gonna be documented on my social media and so all of that's public. What's well. your handle? Is it just so at it is, Libby Gear? Yeah, just at Libby.gear um, for Instagram and then Libby Gear for Facebook. Those are probably the two I'm most active on. Awesome. Well, yeah. I so appreciate your time today and your vision thank you. for the future. Yeah. Well, thank you for all you do. Uh, well, I, you know what? I'm just happy to be along for the ride yeah. in this crazy thing called life. So. <laughs> well, you're such a voice for thank you. the sport, but you're also a huge voice for women in the sport. Thanks. And so that's awesome appreciate to look it. up to. And, well, I appreciate you coming yeah. and uh, driving three hours from Houston this morning. The Lord have mercy. <laughs> oh, it was beautiful. Yeah. It was beautiful country, beautiful drive. So Perfect. Thank yeah. you so much, Miss Libby. And thank you all for tuning in to this episode of the Wild and Uncut Podcast, brought to you in part by Safari Club International. Uh, you guys, SCI is first for hunters, so I encourage you all, please join us. Um, I want to reiterate the fact that 70% of their local fundraisers stay in those communities. Only 30% of the largest fundraisers actually go back to corporate. So when you attend a local SEI banquet, your chapters are actually serving your communities. If you have a project you're looking for funding, you want to support, you have an idea, reach out to your local chapters. They will help you organize. They will help you get funding. We will help you. SEI is first for hunters and that's what we're here for. So you guys join us and thank you again. Without all of you, this podcast wouldn't be possible. So thank you for tuning in. I want to invite you to try this powerful spectrum of collagen peptides for yourself. Combined with a healthy diet and exercise program, you can see improvements throughout your body to help you look and feel younger. Head over to the wildernessathlete.com website to shop or learn more for yourself. When conditions get tough on a mountain hunt, your gear must be tougher. Making every opportunity count means selecting equipment that will not fail. Any condition, anywhere, Hornady Outfitter ammunition is designed to perform. Available in a wide range of cartridges from 243 to 375 Ruger. When you're looking for a hard hitting, deep penetrating bullet and cartridge that performs in the most rugged environments, look no further than Hornady Outfitter Ammunition. Thank you for listening to the Wild and Uncut podcast. If you would like to hear more, be sure to subscribe to my Pursue the Wild digital series on YouTube and follow me at Christy Titus on Facebook and Instagram.